So we know there is uh, a Christopher Alfred book, Stormy Wind Fulfilling His Word, which Brother Tony Benson wrote. Perhaps the older ones of us have got this edition. Just shortly before he died, he extensively revised it and added some more chapters, brought it up to date. So that is the latest version. If you haven't got the book, it's well worth getting because it's a fascinating review of how God has used the world of nature to move forward his purpose. And that's some of the things that we're going to be looking at. As I say, it's taken from verse 8 of the psalm that we read, Stormy Wind Fulfilling His Word. Now, the closing five psalms are all Hallel psalms, praise psalms. And so this psalm, like the other Hallel ones, is full of praise. So what we're going to do is just briefly go through this psalm, see its structure, see the various people and objects that are called upon to praise God. And then we'll look at how God uses the world of nature to carry forward his purpose. Now, you might not, if you're on a small screen, be able to uh, read that particularly clearly, but um, this is just to show the structure of it. So the first part, the first six verses, as praise from heavenly things. And then from 7 to 13 is praise from earthly things. And then the conclusion is praise from his saints. So let's look at these three sections. Uh, obviously, we can now enlarge them, just looking at the first six verses there. These are the praise from heavenly things. So he calls upon angels uh, and all his hosts to praise him. Uh, so those are living objects. And he also calls upon sun, moon, stars to praise him. Uh, the heaven of heavens and the waters that be above the heavens. And why should they praise God? Because he commanded and they were created. And we see when we examine the heavenly bodies and the things on the earth, the things of his creation, absolute marvel and wonder and awe, which tells us that it is a great God who's brought these things into being and revealed himself through his word. And um, we have this glorious hope that there is to be a better day when Christ is here and the kingdom established. And so the conclusion there in verse six, he established them forever and ever. He made a decree which shall not pass. So we know that the heavens and the earth, although the political heavens and earth are going to change, the physical earth is here to stay. And eventually, beyond the millennium, God will dwell on earth with all his immortal saints. So he's called upon the <coughs> sun and moon to praise him. Now the sun and the moon are completely different sizes and that black dot represents the size of the moon. Well, that, that's not true because that black dot is far too big. If you can see, just depends on what screen you're looking at, if you can see a little dot at the bottom of that arrow, then that is the size of the moon in relation to the size of the sun. And yet the most amazing thing is that when we have an eclipse, which happens when the moon passes between the sun and the earth, although it's 400 times smaller diameter, because the moon is 400 times closer to the earth than the sun, it does appear that the moon and the sun are exactly the same size. So, uh, sorry, I'm going the wrong way. So when the shadow of the moon comes between the earth and the sun, when it reaches its climax, then it's a perfect fit. Now, that doesn't have to be. Eclipses would still happen, but not quite in the same beauty and glory. But it is the mark of a, an incredible designer. If it's going to do something, then God does it right. And though they are so totally different in size, yet there is this apparent 
equalness in size so that as one scientist said it's like a plug fitting into the plug hole and of course evolutionists say well that's just happiness chance just a chance occurrence no that's a pointer to the glory of god and the great majesty and craftsmanship that he has and so the middle section is asking for praise from earthly things dragons deeps fire hail uh, vapor stormy wind mountains hills fruitful trees cedars beasts cattle creeping things flying fowl kings of the earth peoples princes judges young and old men and children old men children let them praise the name of yahweh for his name alone is excellent his glory is above the earth and heaven so again where does this praise come from well it comes from the earth and again where does that praise come from well it comes from the things that god has created all these things that we read in the mountains and then he turns to uh, living creatures uh, beasts and birds and humans um, let us all praise god why because his name alone is excellent. There is no other God. Man exalts other men and puts them as their gods. But we know there is only one true and ever living God. And we see his glory in the earth and the heaven. Wherever we look, we see beauty and design. So he splits it into inanimate objects and into animate objects who should reflect praise. And they do reflect praise. They have voices, mountains and trees don't have voices, but we see them in their appearance. They speak to us. That's majestic. That's wonderful. That's been designed. That's perfect. And so birds sing praise to God. Um, and we as humans should equally praise God continually for his wonderful works. And so wherever we look, whether it's at mountains or mice, all have a glory and reflect praise to their creator. Whether it's stars or stallions, all have a glory. Uh, and we see beauty, we see design, we see symmetry, which you know, chance, random events over millions of years can't explain. Everything is so beautiful. Um, and reflect glory. And so whether we look at uh, the frost, as an earlier psalm, the psalm before says, Praise ye Yahweh, for it is good to sing praises unto our God, for it is pleasant and praise is comely. And as a commentator put it, praise is comely. It is decent, benefiting and proper that every intelligent creature should acknowledge the supreme being, and as he does nothing but good to the children of men, so they should speak good of his name. So let's now have a look at examples of uh, God's mighty power in nature. Uh, and first of all, just uh, a few examples from nature. And this is uh, from the oldest book in the Bible, Job. Job, behold, God is great, and we know him not. Also, can any understand the spreading of the clouds or the noise of his tabernacle? Behold, he spreadeth his light upon it and covereth the bottom of the sea. For by them he judgeth his people, he giveth meat in abundance. By the breath of God is frost given, and the breadth of the water is straightened. And it is turned about by his counsels, that they may do whatsoever he commandeth them upon the face of the world in the earth. He causes it to come, whether for correction, or for his land, or for mercy. So God uses nature for these very many things 
to correct nations, to correct individuals, to bless and to curse. So what a wonderful world we live in, what variety, what usefulness that the trees can give us timber and we can build houses and make so much from. Everything that God has made has a value, has a purpose. As the prophet Nahum said, God is jealous, Yahweh revengeth, Yahweh revengeth and is furious. Yahweh will take vengeance on his adversaries. He reserveth wrath for his enemies. Yahweh is slow to anger and great in power and will not at all acquit the wicked. Yahweh hath his way in the whirlwind and in the storm and the clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebuketh the sea and maketh it dry and drieth up all the rivers. Bashan languisheth and Carmel and the flower of Lebanon languisheth. The mountains quake at him and the hills melt and the earth is burned at his presence. Yea, the world and all that therein is. So again, we can see Naaman picking up the fact that God uses stormy wind and we are obviously encompassing more than just wind, earthquake, volcanoes, floods, famines, when we think of stormy winds, to bring judgments, to move things forward um, according to his plan and purpose. Right from the beginning of creation, God knew everything that would happen and was able to manipulate nations using the world of nature under angelic guidance to move things forward. And Nahum carries on and says, who can stand before his indignation? Who can abide in the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire. Rocks are thrown down by him. Yahweh is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knoweth them that trust in him. But with an overrunning flood, he will make an utter end of the place thereof, and darkness shall pursue his enemies. So we think of the time of the flood when the fountains of the great deep were broken up and the earth was covered in water and the windows of heaven were opened. So again, God used the natural phenomena of uh, volcanic action, breaking up the crust of the earth, allowing the waters inside the earth to be released and causing water that was stored in the heavens to come down upon the earth. And uh, if we just uh, have a very brief look, this is a cross section of the earth, which has its inner core and outer core and a mantle, and then a very thin crust. It's relatively thin compared with the rest of it. And that thin crust is what sustains life. Now, the interesting thing is that when we analyse the totality of the rocks of the earth, 10% of the rocks of earth are sedimentary, and 90, this is a very simplification, just dividing into two groups, sedimentary and igneous rocks, but 90% are igneous. But when we look at the surface of the earth, then things are very different. 75% of the surface of the earth is sedimentary, and the rest is igneous, where it has pushed up through the sedimentary and is lying on top of it, which is a very strong point of, to the truth of the Bible that in God's judgments upon the world of Noah, he sent an almighty flood which destroyed all breathing life upon the earth, apart from those that were in the ark. And of course, sedimentary water, sedimentary rocks are rocks which have contained fossils, which have been laid down by water. And so we see, as we look around the sea coast, many examples of sedimentary rocks. And they all have the appearance, they must have been laid in quite a short time because the evolutionary time span that what we're looking at there is maybe, you know, hundreds of millions of years just doesn't make sense because there's no sign of erosion. 
Each layer just nestles on top of it. Yes, they change different types, but again, there's very little sign of any erosion. Uh, if any of you have been to Hunstanton, the, the cliffs are well known. People come from around the world to look at the strata on the rocks at Hunstanton. And again, there's no indication that there's huge gaps between the different layers. If we just hone in, you see that there are three different layers there and each sits perfectly upon the other, making much more sense that these were all laid down in the time of the flood, as the flood waters rolled around the earth, carrying animals, and therefore we would expect the earlier lower fossils to be of smaller creatures, um, and the more the bigger the creature, the longer it could escape by climbing up hills until they were totally overwhelmed. And we have examples here of what they call polystrate fossils, where a fossil goes through many strata. I, mean, I guess that chap's about six foot high. It's clear that the tree behind must be about uh, 12 foot high. Now, again, that's going through strata, which the Geologists would tell us, well, there's millions of years represented in all those layers. Uh, and the thought that a tree trunk could just be slowly swallowed up over millions of years just doesn't make sense. It all points to a rapid burial at the time of the flood. And we know from day two of creation that God moved waters into the heavens. And presumably this is the water that came down in the time of the flood. We move on to the time of Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, it's thought now from more modern archaeology that this is Sodom uh, and Gomorrah. Um, it's been extensively excavated in the past 10 years or so. Uh, and they're a reasonable you know, kilometre from one end of the city to the other. Reproduction of the city, an upper city and a lower city with a strong wall all around it, a city gate there into this city. And this is seriously thought to be the city that Lot entered and dwelt in at the time of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Because when they dig down, they find at just the right uh, time period, uh, a very deep layer of ash uh, and then you can see where it has been rebuilt on top of the ash. So there's a city underneath, a layer of ash, uh, and then a rebuilding of the city. And things like bones, human bones, are broken and shattered. This was no ordinary burial. This points to some unnatural event, overwhelming catastrophe that destroyed and it also points to intense heat being used because the mud bricks which they used have been so hard fired that it's estimated that that would need a temperature of about 6,000 degrees Celsius to bake it as hard as that. And also uh, pottery is, has been melted in the heat and so on the right of the picture is what they call trinitite, which is pottery and things like that, rock even, in places where they have carried out nuclear explosions, testing the atom bombs. And the intense heat that that creates melts uh, rock and any object that is there into a very similar appearance to that of Sodom and Gomorrah. And we know from what the Bible says that fire and brimstone from heaven. So that is an interesting confirmation. Again, God used this force of nature to destroy uh, that particular area and um, the wicked inhabitants of that area. So we move on to the time of the Exodus and the many plagues that God brought upon Egypt. Many of them did involve wind. Uh, the fourth plague was flies. Now, it doesn't directly tell us on that that the wind brought them in, but it would make sense because they suddenly appeared and they suddenly disappeared, that wind was used to bring them in. 
Uh, on the seventh plague with the hail, it also talks about lightning and storms and various happenings there. The locusts were certainly, we're told, were brought in on the wind uh, and were taken away uh, by the wind. Um, the ninth plague was darkness. How that was brought about, we're not told, but could be that wind would bring thick clouds over Egypt. Remember that Israel was spared from the experience of the first three plagues, but was then spared the rest of the plague. So Israel had light and Egypt had darkness. So in some miraculous way, presumably clouds were arranged so that there was no sun upon Egypt, but Israel had some light. So again, a, a wonderful use of stormy wind uh, to fulfill his purpose. And of course, when they came to cross the Red Sea, that there was this strong east wind which drove the waters back, and they became a wall on either side, so they were able to pass through. And when the Egyptians tried to follow, we know what happened to them. And in the wilderness, they were hungry, weren't they? They complained about the matter. They wanted some meat, and they remembered the leeks and the onions and the garlic. And that's what God did. A wind from the Lord brought quails from the sea. And they were two cubits high upon the face of the earth. There were just wave after wave after wave of these birds were brought in so that the Israelites were easily able to catch them, to kill them, make parts of them. So again, God uses the wind to uh, feed his people and to show his might and his power to his people. But when God says, I can provide you with meat, and they mocked and said, how can you? Well, God showed that he could do it. And when they came into the promised land, we know on several occasions, hailstones, uh, they came upon the five kings and more died of the hailstones than in the battle. And at the end of Joshua, it talks about the hornets, God bringing these terrible hornets in, which drove the inhabitants of their earth. They fled uh, away from the land because of the viciousness of these hornets. Uh, and there have been plagues, there was one in France about five or six years ago, which caused a lot of problems. And God uses hail um, again in Judges chapters four and five when Sisera brought his armies to defy Israel. And again, floods and hailstones were used to destroy his army. And much later on in the time of the kings, Jehoshaphat built a fleet of ships to go to Ez, uh, uh, they were at Ezion Geba, to go to Tarshish with the king of Israel. And he shouldn't have had that alliance. And um, we're told that the ships were broken at Ezion Geba, which I think was where they were harboured. And um, the Hebrew word for broken is crushed, broken up. So again, one visualises a strong storm just smashing the boats together, um, breaking them and sinking them. And of course, Jonah, very much stormy wind was involved, wasn't there? Because the mariners were toiling because of the great waves and suspected that it was due to somebody on board. And Jonah put his hand up and said, it's me, throw me overboard. So again, the use of stormy wind to further his purpose, to bring about repentance in Nineveh, so that it gave a delay before Nineveh came against God's people. When we jump to New Testament times, I mean, I'm missing out lots of examples, but uh, we think of several times Jesus and the Sea of Galilee, storms involved, the disciples rowing and Jesus walking on the water um, many times. And then Paul, uh, he recorded in Corinthians that he'd already experienced three shipwrecks. Uh, and we know in Acts chapter 27 that the very famous shipwreck, which is graphically portrayed by Luke. That must have been his fourth shipwreck. Again, it, it had the effect, didn't it, of 
because all the people were brought safely to shore and Paul was able to perform miracles. And Paul had warned them that the ship would be broken, but everybody would live. That put Paul in good standing so that when he went to Rome, he was given freedom. Although he was chained to a Roman soldier, he was able to live in his own hired house. Uh, I'm not sure, you know, this effect of the shipwreck uh, played an important role in moving that step forward so that he wasn't a common prisoner as the other prisoners who were on board were. I think of the earthquake at Philippi. Yes, there have earthquakes many times at Philippi, but this just came at the right time, didn't it? Paul and Silas imprisoned, singing praise to God. Suddenly the earthquake came and the doors were thrown open, and the chains fell off and the jailers sprang in. And uh, we know the result of that, that he and his family came to the truth as a result of an earthquake, just timed by the angels, precisely the right moment. And an uh, uh, outstanding outcome from that earthquake. And again, it must have had an influence upon the leaders, the uh, governors of Philippi, because uh, they allowed Paul to leave the city without any more action against them. So, you know, we, we, it's only in hindsight, looking back, you can see all the various things that can happen when God uses his forces of nature. Now, I just want to look at a few turning points in history. We know from Daniel chapter 8 that the Babylonian kingdom was succeeded by the Persian uh, Empire, uh, Medo-Persian, and then that was to be replaced by the Greek, and that was to be replaced by the um, Roman. And again, one can see the hand of God in the transition from the Persian Empire to the Greek Empire. The Persian Empire was very extensive, but they couldn't conquer Greece. Um, they weren't strong enough to conquer it, and it was a long distance away. But they were determined to take Greece. And uh, Daniel chapter 8 gives us the broad outline, but in chapter 11 and verse 2, it just gives a specific detail of how eventually um, Greece was superior and conquered Persia. But we're just going back a little bit, 150 years. Um, they attempted to take Greece. So BC 492, roughly, Darius the Great, On a mighty storm uh, and wrecked his boats. And so that was the end of that. So they set about rebuilding the fleet. Darius actually died, and it was some Xerxes that took over. And by 481, they had built 1,320 ships. And the Greeks only had 370. So it looked, you know, a foregone conclusion that. Persia would conquer Greece. So they went, uh, they successfully took Athens, which was the capital city, and then there followed an almighty storm causing great panic. And Herodotus, um, almost contemporary historian writing that period, said heaven was indeed doing everything possible to reduce the superiority of the Persian fleet and bring it down to the size of the Greek. And so uh, they lost 400 ships in that storm. And then that was shortly followed by another storm in which they lost another 200 ships. So yes, they were greatly reduced. But uh, they still had their superiority. The Greeks, uh, through substitutes, caused them to be trapped in a certain location um, 
and the Greek ships, although they were fewer in number, managed to decimate the Persian navy. And Xerxes, who was on land watching the battle, saw to his dismay his ships being routed by these Greeks. Uh, there was, sorry, uh, there was uh, a, another battle after this. They, they regrouped the, what navy was left. And there was another battle. They lost that battle. And so they gave up. And so that meant for 150 years, there was no invasion of Persia to Greek, enable the Greeks to build up their strength, build up their army. So that in the time of Alexander the Great, uh, 150 years later, he was able to sweep in and take the Persian Empire, as scripture had foretold. So jumping forward to AD 70 and the events leading up to AD 70, which was the destruction of Jerusalem, we have the three gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, Recall the Mount Olivet prophecy where God, uh, the Lord Jesus, foretold the destruction of Jerusalem. They had been walking past the temple and admiring the huge stones that the temple was made from, and the beautiful architecture of it. And Jesus turned around and said to them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, uh, these great buildings, there shall not be left one stone upon another. That shall not be thrown down. And they were deeply shocked because the temple was the very centre of Jewish worship. And the thought, well, the temple was going to be completely destroyed was something which took their breath away. And they had to ask Jesus for signs and more information about what was to happen. We know just how accurate Jesus' words were. The buildings were thrown down. The foundations weren't, but it was the buildings that they were admiring. They were thrown down. And the Romans, when they destroyed the city, set light to it. There was a lot of gold in the walls were overlaid with gold. And they prized apart the blocks to get to the gold. And the, with the fire and destruction, it all came crashing down. And Josephus records, who you know, saw it happen, he was there at the time, so thoroughly levelled and dug up that no one ever visiting the city would believe it had ever been inhabited. So such was the destruction. Now, the Lord Jesus gave a series of signs, and the third and fourth signs were of famines and earthquakes fearful sights and signs. Uh, and the Gospels tell us that. that Matthew says famines, pestilences, earthquakes. Mark talks about earthquakes, famines and troubles. And Luke talks about earthquakes, famines, pestilences, fearful sights and great signs from heaven. Now, as we go through Acts of the Apostles, we read of famines. Um, it is recorded in the Acts of the Apostles, but um, a commentator, Adam Clark, says that there was a famine foretold by Agabus, which is one that the Bible talks about in Acts chapter 11, which is mentioned by Suetonius and Tacitus and Isubius, which came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar, and was so severe at Jerusalem that Josephus says that many died for lack of food. Pestilences are the usual attendant of famines, as the scarcity and badness of provision generally produces epidemic disorders. So that bears testimony not only to the famines, but to the, test, the pestilences that followed. And outside the Bible, Tacitus, uh, he records Jewish um, Roman history, um, covering that period and looking at the year AD 51, he says of Rome, this year witnessed many prodigies, signs or omens including repeated earthquakes, so something outside the normal. And Josephus again records an earthquake in Judea of such magnitude 
as he says, the constitution of the universe was compounded for the destruction of men. And he also wrote that earthquakes were a common calamity. So yes, that is an area that has earthquakes, but this was something out of the ordinary. And this is what the Lord had told his disciples. This is part of the signs. When you see an abundance of earthquakes, then know that the destruction of Jerusalem is now at hand. And Josephus records earthquakes in Crete, in Smyrna, in Miletus, in Chios, in Samos, in Laodicea, Hierapolis, and Colossae, in Campania, in Italy, in Rome, and in Judea. And again, Josephus uh, records another occurrence, a, a, a temp dreadful tempest, violent winds, vehement showers, continuing lightnings and thunders, which led many to believe that these things portended some uncommon calamity. And that was indeed true. It was portending the calamity of the destruction of the temple um, by the hands of the Romans. If we think of more modern history, we can think of the defeat of the Spanish Armada, 1588. Again, very much strong involved with that. Wind. Uh, Britain was able to use change in wind direction to set old ships on fire and send them towards the Spanish fleet, so it set the fleet to light. But there were a series of tremendous storms which the Spanish vessels weren't able to um, survive. Uh, many, many of ships were broken. And it was recorded that that year was an exceptionally stormy year. Cyclone followed cyclone. So again, we see the hand of God working. And out of the 130 ships that Spain set out with, she lost 67. So half of them were lost. Whereas the British just lost eight ships, which were fire ships, which she had deliberately set on fire to uh, set the Spanish ones on fire. So you can see the hand of God. Uh, saving England from coming under Catholic rule again. Uh, and it was a turning point in British history. We can think of other ones, I'm not going to look in any detail, but 1805, Nelson's victory at Trafalgar, very much the weather played, um, the wind direction played a huge part in that. In 1940, the evacuation of British troops from France, the Dunkirk evacuation. It wasn't stormy wind, it was the opposite, when incredible calm, which enabled the little tiny ships to successfully go across the channel and bring troops back. And more recently, in the lifetime of all of us, uh, 2016, referendum day, there was a big storm that just affected the southeast of England, uh, most unusual storm because normally the storms come from the Atlantic. The storm came from the direction of Europe and it prevented many of the people living in Kent and Sussex, the commuter belt for uh, the London bankers, etc. It prevented them from voting. Voting booths were, polling booths were flooded and a lot of houses were flooded, so they got other things to attend to. And we know what a small majority uh, the referendum was carried by. If that storm hadn't come, um, because this was an area, Southeast England was an area where most would have voted to remain, it might have affected the results, but God knew what he was doing. That storm just came, broke at midnight, on referendum day, causing a lot of flooding. Now we know that God is going to use <clears throat> the world of nature uh, when Christ comes. We know from Daniel chapter 12, verse one, there's gonna be a time of trouble such as never was. And we can think of in the past, the terrible effects of earthquakes and floods and fires and volcanoes. It's going to be all those put together. 
And we know from Zechariah chapter 14, there is a tremendous earthquake in the land of Israel, which will have repercussions around the world. Now, it's 10 years ago, so some of our younger ones won't remember it. But the earthquake that hit Japan in March 2011, which was uh, off the coast of Japan, biggest earthquake that they had had, and that triggered a tsunami of such devastation that it was recorded as a once in a thousand year occurrence. And there has been evidence that there have been two earlier tsunamis on a similar scale, uh, three massive events in the past 3,000 years. Um, what I'm suggesting is it won't be another thousand years. Uh, such events will happen again very shortly when the Lord Jesus comes to save his people from the hand of his, their enemies. But that earthquake, um, 16,000 dead, 6,000 injured, a million houses damaged. But the most frightening thing was the tsunami. Waves up to 40 metres, 133 feet high, and they swept inland up to six miles, 10 kilometres. And it spread in the other direction across the Pacific, 500 miles an hour. Absolutely awesome, the power that was released in that earthquake off the coast of Japan. In fact, the power of that earthquake was estimated at 32,000 times greater than the Hiroshima bomb. So absolutely power that God has at his disposal to be used at the right time, in the right place, in the right circumstances. Now we know from Zechariah chapter 14 that uh, in that day his feet shall stand upon the Mount of Olives, Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. There shall be a very great valley. Half the mountain shall remove towards the north and half of it towards the south. Now that's an earthquake and a half, isn't it? To actually physically split a mountain and move it so there's a big valley in between. I don't know whether there have been any examples in recent times of such powerful earthquakes to do that. But we do know that God has prepared for this event, that Israel sits at that meeting place, that point where the African plate meets the Arabian plate, and the Rift Valley, the Jordan Valley, uh, one plate is moving in one direction and the other in another, and Israel has been expecting for a long time, it's long overdue, uh, a big earthquake. Um, it would lead to a lot of deaths, a lot of injuries, uh, a lot of people being dislodged. And that's a 7.5, an even greater one, which would have to be much, much greater to split them out of olives, will do immense damage. Now, major earthquakes, BC 31, 363, 749, 1033. Been a lot of earthquakes since, but not major ones. Um, there was a recent article, in fact, there was a, a similar article about a couple of days ago, um, doing some more research on this. But that, uh, Israel is very worried because from the work they're doing, they can tell that they're long overdue for a major earthquake, um, which will lead to catastrophic. Um, destruction because a lot of the buildings in Israel, the older buildings, were built without um, being equipped to withstand earthquakes. So there's a lot of buildings which will be absolutely decimated. Now, thanks to Google Earth, we can take a quick trip to Jerusalem. You can see the temple there on the left-hand side. This is the Mount of Olives. And you can see where that hand is, uh, 
running roughly there, but this is a bit curved, uh, is an earthquake fault line. It's already there in the middle of the Mount of Olives. In fact, if I just superimpose the map, there is the earthquake fault line. So God has made preparation for the mountain to move north and to move south. That's precisely the fault line runs east-west. And so when we look at the Mount of Olives, um, just uh, you see the big fields, and it just roughly runs up the middle of the picture there, just to the right of the middle of the picture. And so when this earthquake comes, that huge mountain is going to be split into two. And because of the earthquake, water will come up from the uh, foundations of Jerusalem and will run down into the Dead Sea, which will have been elevated in the earthquake and will heal it. And instead of being a salt dead sea, it will be a living sea with fish in it, uh, a complete transformation. So if we look at the topography now, this is from Stormy Wind, Brother Benson's book. Um, you can see that the level of the Dead Sea is way below sea level. But such is the force of this earthquake. It's got to flatten the top of the Judean hills and it's got to push up the Dead Sea. So what will result will be something looking like this, because the earthquake affects not just the Mount of Olives, it affects the whole area. In fact, it has repercussions around the whole earth. It's got to make an elevated area for the temple to be built. The temple at the moment uh, is hidden from view, but in the kingdom age, the temple is going to be elevated so it can be seen by the pilgrims. On the flow of the River Jordan, we think it sounds as if it's going to be reversed. So the waters flow from the temple into the now living sea, no longer dead sea, and then flows northwards and outwards into the Mediterranean. So tremendous changes take place. As Isaiah says, it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow up to it. So we can see that God has built in the preparation, that fault line already there, ready to be triggered uh, at the right time when Christ and the saints come up from Sinai from the judgment seat to come to save his people who are under the hand of Gog and his companions. And there's Isaiah that tells us that at this time, because this is a latter day uh, prophecy in Isaiah chapter 2, that people will go into the holes of the rocks, caves of the earth for the fear of Yahweh and for the glory of his majesty when he ariseth to shake terribly the earth. And so this earthquake not only affects Israel, there will be numerous earthquakes around the world because the kingdom of God won't be on the foundations of man's skyscrapers and man's industry and all that man has done. It'll be a clean start, a time of terrible judgments. But God is just. What results will be a time of blessing and peace. And the, the, another passage in uh, Isaiah also speaks of this time shall come to pass when he who fleeth from the noise of fear shall fall into the pit, and he that cometh out of the midst of the pit shall be taken in the snare, for the windows from on high are open, and the foundations of the earth do shake. Time of trouble such as never was. The earth, the inhabitants of the earth will be terrified of the things that are happening. And for many, when the Lord Jesus then reveals himself as Israel's king, then they will be ready to accept him. Others will fight to the bitter end and say, this is Antichrist. Uh, we said he's going to come 
and will resist to the end. But God is in control. And as that psalm ended, kings of the earth, all people, princes, all judges of the earth, young men, maidens, old men and children, in the kingdom age, they will praise the name of Yahweh. For his name alone is excellent. His glory is above the earth and heaven. He has also exalted the horn of his people, the praise of all his saints, even of the children of Israel, a people near to him. Hallelujah. And we know how God's plan and purpose centers around Israel. In this day, Israel will be a faithful nation, will accept the Lord Jesus as their Messiah, will be baptized into his name, just as we have been, and will walk in hope of eternal life at the end of the millennium. So God is in control. He knows all things. How reassuring it is for us to know that everything is known to him. In his mercy, he will establish the kingdom. And in his mercy, he will grant us places in that kingdom to help educate the world in these wonderful ways of truth and righteousness. Thank you.